So tonight's topic is how to read a church. And it's a little more Catholic, as I said. Uh, it's about Catholic doctrine and traditions uh, and how they shaped churches before and after Vatican II. Vatican II is sort of a, a neat uh, mark to use because some of us remember before and after, uh, as well as it was a um, phenomenal change in the church. And we've still been battling those uh, changes uh, on both sides for the last 50 years. It was actually 50 years ago this fall that Vatican II took place. In the talk last week when I was talking about craft, I was talking about how buildings prior to the printing press were the most important book that a society would produce. Certainly you go to ancient Egypt and the pharaohs and everything they ever wanted to tell you is inscribed in hieroglyphics on all the walls of all their buildings. And that's why we have such a great record of their, their society. And that was true then of uh, Roman, Greco-Roman sculpture and uh, bas-relief. If you go to the Arch of Titus, we'll see a panel from that later on. It tells you all of Titus's accomplishments. And in the uh, Gothic churches as well, the stained glass told the Bible stories. This was for a pre-literate society. So this is, instead of having a book at home, people would go to the local church and look at the stained glass, and the stained glass would remind them of a Bible story, Old Testament, New Testament, together. The statues would all be their history, preserved for them in physical form. Well, there's one section of the book, Notre Dame de Paris. Um, again, I apologize to my wife for my French accent. Uh, we know it as the Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, by Victor Hugo. In it, the uh, archdeacon has discovered a printing press near Notre Dame and he's going to have it destroyed because the printed book was going to threaten the authority that he represented. And in it, the archdeacon gazed at the giant, gigantic edifice for some time in silence, then extending his right hand with a sigh towards the printed book which lay on the open table and his left hand towards Notre Dame and turning a sad glance from the book to the church, alas, he said, this will kill that. The printing press put in the hands of an individual the ability to spread and proliferate ideas, and it began to threaten the central authority that were the churches. So, using that metaphor of the church as a book, I thought it would be good to go over the vocabulary so that we would learn how to read a church. Hence, that's the title of this week's talk. Because the style and the arrangement and the design of all the churches that we have say something very specific about what we hold esteem and what things mean to us. So this is, a, like I said, a vocabulary review and uh, an etymological review as well. Where do they, all these things come from? If you go back about 2,000 years, you had um, two predominant religious building forms, the temple and the synagogue. Now the temple was the most dominant form and it was a place where people went to interface with their God, usually um, embodied in a statue, and they would make animal sacrifices or other sacrifices to that God, usually bloody sacrifices, to show that they are giving up or giving things in honor of their God. This was a very common practice. Uh, at the time, the ancient Israelis, the Jews of the uh, Roman era in uh, what was then called Palestine or the old state of Israel, had a temple. They obviously didn't have a graven image in that temple. It's a recreation of their temple as opposed to the Parthenon, which is a Greek temple, where there was a statue of Athena and in front of which people would sacrifice animals and burn incense. In the Jewish temple, since they, they didn't believe in the graven image, they had the Ark of the Covenant, which held the remnants of uh, the Ten Commandments or the Torah, which was the one place on earth that they, that they believed God was manifest. In modern Christian thought, we believe God is everywhere. That was not the thought at the time in Judaism. So this is where God was manifest. You would go to the temple for all your important feast days. In fact, we read in uh, the New Testament a number of times uh, Jesus' family, one of the few stories of the Holy Family, is they went to Jerusalem for a festival. And when they came back, since the men traveled with the men and the women traveled with the men, women, uh, they lost Jesus and they couldn't find him and they found him preaching in the temple to the elders. But 
because Judaism was always a people of the word, where the word of God was very important, they had created all around Jerusalem synagogues, places where on the Sabbath they would gather to discuss and read from the Torah and tell the stories they've been telling for a long time. They would uh, frequently sing the Psalms, dance, this is just for the men. But they had a history then of collecting themselves together as a group, assembling, and then praying. This was in contrast to the temple. After 70 AD, they added to that tradition the Talmud, which was a commentary on the Torah. And we'll see why. Here it is, a bas relief from the Arch of Titus, right in the heart of Rome, where uh, Titus gladly shows you how when they destroyed the temple, they walked away with the menorah and other things from the temple of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple because of a revolt. And when they did that, they destroyed the priestly order, the Levites, and the entire Jewish religion was thrown into a, a, a holocaust at the time. They had lost their interface with God. And all that remained were the synagogues, the little places around the uh, Temple of Jerusalem. There was no temple to go to anymore. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no presence of God on earth. But every week they would gather, and they would read the word, and they would talk about it, and they would comment, and they would learn the word. And this survived. This diaspora is the rabbinic tradition that Jews have today, with no temple, with no Ark of the Covenant. It's a collection of the assembly. If you remember, uh, I had discussed how Judaism, the Semitic people were sojourners. So they were not invested in statues. Uh, they were not invested in buildings because they moved from tent to tent. And this probably represented the most anchored approach that they ever had, collecting themselves all the time. So when that sect of Judaism called Christianity began to form, it started in the synagogues. And again, in Acts of the Apostles, you could go and you can see how the apostles preaching would go to the Jews assembled at the synagogue on the Sabbath. And when it was time for them to speak, they would get up and preach the word of, of Jesus. A lot of times they got thrown out. Um, they were considered a cult at the time. But when Christians then began to practice on their own, they continued on in their Eucharist two Jewish traditions. The first being the Liturgy of the Word, that rabbinic tradition of gathering, reading from the Bible, reading from the sacred script, and discussing it, and reviewing it, and singing psalms. Remember at this time in the first century, first couple of decades after Jesus, there were no Gospels. They were getting letters from the uh, from the apostles and Paul. Uh, so they had that liturgy of the word as the first part of their liturgy. And the second part was another Jewish tradition, the Seder meal, the reenactment of the Last Supper, where the table of sacrifice is now the mensa, the table of the meal. And so by putting these two traditions together, you've got the earliest form of the liturgy, which we still practice today. The Eucharist of the Word, the three readings every Sunday, uh, generally the uh, Hebrew Testament, or uh, in the Easter time it would be Acts of the Apostles, an epistle and a gospel, a gospel with a homily. And then the liturgy of the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, Greek word for Thanksgiving, um, where we enact the Last Supper and we consecrate the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And at the very beginning, the belief was that this was a true presence of Jesus, and the bread and wine were transubstantiated into God. A couple of hundred years, Christians are being persecuted. It's an underground religion. Then at 3, uh, 313 AD, there's uh, the Edict of Milan, 
grants religious freedom in the Roman Empire, and it gives uh, Christianity a chance to come above ground, and it's legalized after a few, few hundred years of persecution. So when Christians suddenly get above ground, and they no longer have to hang out in the catacombs, or perform ceremonies in the catacombs, or bury their dead in the catacombs, they come out with a new kind of building problem. Because prior to them, the great buildings of religion were temples, which were meant to be for family groups to sacrifice an animal in front of a statue of God. But the Christians have been practicing for 300 years getting together in groups, small groups that would fit into homes. So when they came out, they wanted to build buildings that would allow large groups of people to be assembled, because there were a lot of Christians at this point. And so they turned to the Romans, who were great builders, and they used the basilica form to become their sacred buildings. The basilica, it's, it's from a word meaning royal chambers. They, uh, the Romans were building these all over the place. When the, a new basilica would be the public offices of the king or the emperor. And then when the building got old and they built a new one, it would become a shopping mall. So the early Christians took old shopping malls and turned them into churches. Why? Because they were an inexpensive way to build a big space. Okay? Imagine this row of columns holding up the roof. Here's a set of chambers out here. This is the Basilica of Amelia, built 193 BC. Um, right in the heart of ancient Rome, if you go to the, uh, the, the ruins there, uh, we could show you where uh, the remnants of it are. In fact, you can go and see where they inscribed in the stone games while they were waiting to, to see a court or to do something. They make game boards right in the stones of the basilica. This is a recreation of it. And this is what it looked like looking down the nave. It should look familiar to you. Because the technology was limited by the span, which usually was wood trusses, the rows of columns were, had a maximum distance that you could get between them, and they would expand on that with a second row of columns, and in some cases a third row, so they could get a lot of space underneath it. It was not column-free space, but it was a, one giant space. And the section was the structural importance of it, so if you ever wanted to make it bigger, you really couldn't make it wider, but you could certainly make it longer. So when the Christians built their first new church, St. Paul's outside the walls in Rome, built in 380 AD, it was destroyed and rebuilt in 1823, so this is a, a recreation of it. They took the shopping mall and they made it holy. Central nave, two side aisles, this is the entrance from the courtyard. They tended, these were urban structures, so they had an outdoor courtyard, very much like a Roman house. So you would come into this open courtyard from the walled city and then enter the church proper where there would be an altar and there would be other church artifacts inside there. This is the inside restored. Again, this section should look at, it's familiar to you. Maybe take off the the outside side aisles, and that's very typical of a Latin church basilica form. Picture on the inside, decorated with mosaics, and there's even a mosaic of every pope who's ever existed in there. There's room for 12 more popes in the main nave. Nothing apocalyptic about it. They plan on going to the side aisles once they were, just in case you were wondering. The, uh, everything old is new again. Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles. Cathedral church built uh, after the earthquake. Um, you've got a church in an urban setting with a wall all the way around it. And like the open court, you kind of come in and you're outside. And then you can go into the church. It's, um, it's a modern looking church, but it's very traditional in its form. And in the other extreme, the Flatirons Community Church in Lafayette, Colorado, took an old shopping mall and they turned it into their church. Cheap, column-free space. Now this is their Christmas Eve celebration. 
doesn't quite look like a Catholic one that I know, but it is the people of God assembling. Christians assemble based on the Jews assembling in the first century AD. In a uh, shameless bit of self-promotion, I did a concept for a church that didn't have a lot of money. And the idea was to learn the lesson that the ancient Christians had known, which was shopping malls are where you get inexpensive space. So the idea was to learn the structural lessons of a uh, big box store, turn it into a church, tweak it a bit so it looked a little more like a church, and uh, you would get something that was modern and still, look, at least in my opinion, looked like a church. Um, and we could build it inexpensively enough. The basilica form was the dominant form of the Latin church, uh, the Western Empire. But in the East, around the same time, 300 AD, in what's now called Salonica, which was then called Thessalonica, letter to the Thessalonians, uh, we have St. George's Church. There's some concept that it might be a repurposed temple or tomb, but that became one of their earliest churches where they could assemble under a dome in the round. Now, they didn't actually put the altar in the middle. They tended to put the altar into a side niche. But that what became a predominant form. If you remember the Pantheon from a couple of weeks ago, round building, that was the inspiration for the dome. And so they began to build this as their predominant form in the Eastern Church. So that when the empire split around the same time under Constantine, what you saw then was the predominant dome centralized plan becoming the Byzantine church that we're familiar with today. Whereas in the Western Empire, the Latin church, the longitudinal church, based on the basilica, became the predominant form. So for the most part, the Latin form has worked as a church for 2,000 years with very little interruption. There have been some technological improvements. Art glass, stained glass, allowing more light to come into it, transforming the light so you get a transcendent space. The pointed arch brought over by the crusaders. It was in some use in the, uh, in the Islamic world, but it became perfected as a structurally purer form of the arch. It was not about building pointed arches, as I said last time. It was about making the wall thin so they could get glass in there. We've turned the pointed arch into a branding thing, so anything with a pointed arch is a Christian church. But it was not about pointed arches. It was about reducing the wall to almost nothing so you could get glass. And then after that rude interruption known as the medieval period, in the Renaissance, they started with the dome again, dome representing the sky. And they began to put domes on their Latin churches. You could do two hours just on Bruno Leschi and his dome, maybe someday. And there were other technological uh, improvements since then. Uh, the pipe organ, originally banned from Catholic churches because it was considered a wind instrument. The wind instrument was the instrument of um, Pan, the fawn, right, the Pan flute. Uh, and, you know, he was half man, half beast. There can't be anything good about that. Uh, but eventually, Christians acquiesced and said, okay, we'll let organs into our churches. Certainly, we've got electric light, air conditioning, structural steel, and sound systems. So while we've had those improvements, we haven't changed the form of the church too much. We've simply added those elements to that longitudinal church. But these are all just tinker toys. These are all just devices that architects use to create the space. What's really intriguing for the, is the theology behind the pieces in there, in the church, and how that works. And so now we're going to look at the formation of the modern liturgy. Okay? And what you will find is that despite what you might think, it was not uniform. Okay? Communication was slow. Enforcement was uneven. There was nothing immutable. There was nothing that was set down and then kept that wasn't done differently elsewhere and perhaps changed two or three times. And it was not Catholic in the small c sense of the word. Catholic meaning universal. It was anything but universal 
even in the Western church. Okay? So we're going to go through 2,000 years of liturgy formation. Because these are the elements that really make a church what it is. Because otherwise, we're just a glorified Roman shopping mall. Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, created the Uniform Creed. We still say it today. In 360, tradition holds that St. Hilary of Poitiers brings the Gloria to the Western Church. We still say it today as part of the Mass, but that came from the Eastern Church. 400 AD, pre-cut bread for the Eucharist is becoming the tradition. It's still leaven, uh, leavened bread at that point. Um, and they had to decree, now that Christianity was legal, up until that point, people kept the Blessed Sacrament in their homes. At this point, they're saying, look, okay, we're above ground. We now are building churches. Why don't we bring all that Eucharist that you keep in your homes, we're going to start keeping it in the churches. Okay? Again, it didn't happen instantly. There was no, it was a tradition that began to, to be enacted. And at this point, we begin to see the uh, ad orientem, the uh, orientem to the east. That is, the altar faces to the east, and the priest faces to the east, and everybody faces to the east. So what we're seeing is about 300 years, 400 years after Christ, the first move away from the table being the mensa, the table we gather around, and we're all standing on one side of it. Council of Agda, 506 AD. At that point, they established that if you want to say whether or not you're Catholic, the test is, did you receive communion at Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost? Now, this doesn't really affect the liturgy. I threw it in there because it seems I know a lot of Catholics who still think this is the entire test. Just receive three times a year on certain dates, and you're a Catholic, and that's good enough. 600 AD, we see Irish um, monks are beginning to institute private confession. Private, uh, prior to that, confessions were generally done at the assembly, in front of everyone. The monks begin private confession, and at that point, there are no confessionals. What they're doing is they're sitting in front of the altar, two chairs, and one is the confessor, and one is the confessee. 700 AD, there are three dominant forms of the liturgy in Europe. The Roman Rite, the Romanized Celtic Rite, and the Hispano-Gallican Rite, so France, Spain. There are also rigid instructions on receiving communion in the hands. 700 AD, they're still standing, as they have always stood in the Eastern Church, they're still receiving communion in the hands. There are earlier references to about 400 AD about making your hands a throne for the Eucharist. But this is, uh, this is a, let's say, a verified citation. At this point, they also have archaeological evidence of waffle makers. So at this point, they've gone from living bread to the wafers. They're still receiving under both species at this point, both bread and wine, but they're morphing into intitio, which is to take the bread, put it on a golden spoon, and dip it into the wine. 900 AD, the Roman Rite dominates, except in Milan and Spain. And somewhere in Rouen, someone decides that communion can only be taken in the mouth. You can no longer take it in the hand. But that's right now, that's just in Rouen. So the rest of Europe is still taking communion predominantly in the hands. If you were here the um, first week, we were talking about how from Augustine to St. Thomas Aquinas, we saw increased spiritualization of the church demanding that the temporal world, the physical world, be considered more and more sinful. And that architecture and the art suppressed the physical so that the statues of the saints on Gothic churches had very few distinguishing body parts to distinguish them as men or women. 
this is part of that tradition from 400 AD to 1300 AD of the body being increasingly considered too sinful to touch the Blessed Sacrament. 1014, the Nicene Creed is finally, officially added to the Roman Rite. So they've had that for 700 years. It wasn't part of the Roman Rite for the first 700 years of its existence. It didn't get added until 1000 AD. 1000 to 1200 AD, the first Lateran Council uh, in 1123, they est finally established celibacy for priests. Prior to that, priests were commonly married, bishops were commonly married. If you were a monk and you took a vow of chastity, you weren't married, obviously, because you couldn't be chaste and be married. But priests had that option. It was a tradition that uh, was getting to be more popular, and it was not a, uh, a Vatican down imposition. It was from the bottom up. It was, was the monks and the people who were saying that poverty is the true calling and we shouldn't worry about supporting families. So it was the monks who started this movement that said, we should all be celebrate if we're, ser uh, if we're serving God, because we can't serve God and our family. So it wasn't imposed on people, it, it grew from the ground up. At this point, there is, in the Lateran Council, directives that place the tabernacle to the left or right near the main altar, not on it, or in the sacristy. 1274, Summa Theologica, Book 382.3. Thomas Aquinas, after doing a phenomenal amount of work on a, why is there evil, how do we know there's a God, etc., gets to the point and says communion should only be on the tongue because the human body is sinful and only the fingertips of the priests, which have been sanctified, are worthy of touching the body of Christ. Thirteen hundred to sixteen hundred. What we're seeing now is, as a result of this separation of people from the Blessed Sacrament, is we're seeing a response. We're seeing the increase in the number of confessions, and confessionals begin to pop up um, because people know they're not worthy enough to receive Jesus. Now we can talk about how none of us are ever ever worthy. We say it every week at Mass right before we receive, going back to the Roman centurion who said, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you in my house. Okay? We are not worthy. The, the question is, how unworthy are we? Okay? So what you saw was a decrease in the amount of people receiving, an increase in the amount of people confessing in order to, to, re, um, to receive. A tradition that a lot of us remember from the past where you wouldn't think of uh, receiving on Sunday if you had not been to confession on Saturday. In the uh, book, um, Love in the Time of Cholera, uh, the main married couple, she suspects he's having an affair because he stopped receiving communion. Why? Because he hasn't confessed his sin. It was a dead giveaway. Um, at this time then, also because uh, the Holy Land is falling to Islam, we see Stations of the Cross beginning to make their appearance inside of churches because you can no longer make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And so in support of the Crusaders, they would set up the Stations of the Cross because you couldn't actually go to the location in Jerusalem anymore. It was being controlled by Islam. The Hail Mary was finalized. I guess after 1,300 years of editing, they figured they got it right. What we saw was, since people were not receiving communion, that adoration of the Eucharist in the monstros was becoming popular. I can't receive the Lord because I'm unworthy, but I can gaze at it from a distance and pray in the presence of God. We're seeing more receiving on the tongue, but it's still uh, in your hands hasn't disappeared. And when we're seeing re uh, receiving, again, because you're not worthy, we're seeing more people feel the need to kneel down in order to receive the Blessed Sacrament. And as a deference to that, they start building altar rails so they can put a cloth on it. So if any bread falls from their mouth, it falls on the cloth, and they can pick up the cloth and handle it later on. So altar, this was like the hardest thing to find in doing the research, because there's like no definitive document 
And, uh, and if you go to the websites that talk about kneeling and receiving, it's all, you know, all sort of nasty, non-historical stuff. It's uh, everyone with an agenda. Little thing happens around this time, 1517, Martin Luther nails his fi uh, 95 theses to, uh, to the cathedral, and the Protestant Reformation begins formally, and that shapes the next 500 years. Also at this time, the Gregorian calendar, 1582. They finally figured out that uh, the Roman calendar, the Julian calendar was off. They were off by about 10 days where the start of spring was no longer uh, March 21st or March 22nd. It was occurring about 10 days earlier. And that's when they, they began like the leap year and all that. Um, it was not universal. So in 1582, the only place following this calendar was the Vatican and the city of Rome and a few Vatican states that the Pope controlled. It took about 200 years before London got around to going on to the Gregorian calendar. Council of Trent, 1545, 16, 1563. Here it is. This is when they really make uniform all the various rites into the Roman rite. At that point, they actually considered the vernacular. Should we celebrate the Mass in the language of the people, or should we keep it in Latin? And I'm sure someone said, ah, it's 1545, we have time. Let's shelve that to the next council. Okay? It was actually never intended to abolish all the other rites, but it was just saying, well, look, you know, here's one that we like, this is what will make work. But remember, with the Protestant Reformation, suddenly, testing how Catholic you were became very important. Okay? And they began to abolish all the local practices. Because they couldn't tell if you were doing something that was authentically Catholic or if you were doing one of those little Protestant things that the church found irritating. So by making it uniform and enforcing it, they could tell that you were still being Catholic. And at this point, uh, novenas began to get started. First communion was moved down to the age of reason. You used to have to be an adult. They moved it down to the age of seven. So people in the preparation of uh, initiation could receive communion, young people, sooner. And then Paul V said, the tabernacle goes on the altar. Prior to that, it wasn't there. And it was probably in response to all the Protestant um, religions that were saying that there was no true presence in the Blessed Sacrament. It was like saying, ah, if you really thought Jesus was in the blessed, why do you keep it in the sacristy? You keep it in a dinky little closet, no one can see it. If you were really believing, oh yeah? Oh yeah, we, we really believe it's Jesus. Tell you what, we're going to put it on the altar. That's how much we believe it's Jesus. You get this sort of orthodoxy that grows out of the conversation that people are having religiously. Is it the true presence? And that's where you see things really begin to consolidate. So, 1962, 1964, Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII uses the phrase, open up the windows in the Vatican, let a little fresh air into it. There was definitely an attempt to go back to the rites of the first century. The apostolic communities. And that was one of the reasons, because the, the goal was to increase participation. Because by 1950, you had a mass going on there in Latin, in a language that most of people didn't understand. And most of you probably remember seeing the little old ladies in black with the rosary during the whole mass, because there was nothing for them to do other than pray their rosary. It was a separation of the people from the action of the mass. And the Vatican Council in 1962 tried to eliminate that separation. Now, a lot of things were misunderstood. It was about options. It wasn't about changing things so you couldn't do things the old way. It was about creating the option. So if you didn't want to receive communion in your hand, you could still receive it on your tongue. No one said you had to take it in your hand. And that's where they get a little bit of bad press, to the point where, in 2007, uh, the Pope had to reaffirm that, yes, you actually could receive communion if you're kneeling down and you, and you put out your tongue. 
because a lot of people were complaining, I want to do it this way. And then there were some priests who were saying, well, I, I can't give it to you because it's not, not proper. So that's the evolution of the liturgy, and we'll see how that manifests today in today's Mass. But what I find interesting is that we as Roman Catholics believe that Jesus rose from the dead in order to redeem mankind. We're all agreed on that, okay? That God is a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're agreed on that one too. And that Jesus is truly present in the Holy Eucharist. And we agree on that one as well. And there are a lot of our brother religions, who aren't Roman Catholic, who embrace these things as well. So you think with all this really critical, tough, miraculous stuff that we agree on, that everything else should be easy. But no, we're Catholic, so we fight about these things. Where do we put the tabernacle? Where do we put the baptismal font? Do we need an altar rail so we can kneel to receive? Do we receive only on the tongue or in our hands? Do we stand during the consecration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? These are the things that we argue about. Again, you wonder if Jesus came back and said, guys, you're not getting it, okay? This isn't about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is very Pharisee about what's the right way. But we're trying to show that we're Catholic. We've got to have some rules, some commonality. And there is something nice about going into a Catholic church in one country or another and seeing some similar things. So here's some, a little early, well, I'm not dismissing you yet. We're going we're to go through uh, current regulations. But when I first got into liturgical design, and I got the official books, not the books written by people interpreting the official books, but I got the General Instruction of the Roman Missal. I was surprised how open and casual the directives were. I thought there was going to be like building code that says, you know, if you have a door to a handicapped bathroom, it's got to be clear 32 inches, so it has to be at least a 34-inch door, and it's got to rotate 90. I thought it was going to be like building code. It wasn't. It wasn't telling me that the altar has to be uh, two cubit by three cubit or quite open in it, the way it's written. What you find is that everyone whose job it is to get churches built has an agenda, and they begin to insert their agenda into it. So in addition to um, the general instruction of the Roman Missal, that conferences of bishops establish and determine practices to make practices within a region uniform. So the American church does things differently than the European church. And within the diocese in the United States, there is even some leeway. You know, if you go to a um, church when you're on vacation traveling on the country, you have to figure out, are we in a standing diocese or in a kneeling diocese? And then the other thing I discovered, and I mentioned earlier that if there's any sort of controversy about whether we kneel during the consecration or stand or take the communion in hand, that there are a lot of people who have written nasty vitriolic commentary on it, all presuming that they're the only ones who know the proper Catholic way and that there is a single proper Catholic way. And that was why it was hard. I was trying to find, well, when did we start kneeling? And, and the, there was very little scholarship that I could find, certainly on the internet, and you know, I was trying to pull some books, but nothing, nothing was really definitive. So I'm going to go into the current directives on liturgical design about altars, ambos, Eucharistic chapels. Source of information is the general instruction of the Roman Missal. This is it, the English uh, version of it. Built of Living Stone is the US Catholic Bishops Conference interpretation of the general uh, instruction of the Roman Missal, giving some guidelines. It expands on the 1986 Environment and Art in Catholic Worship, which is sort of the first definitive book. During a lot of my um, history of the liturgy, I got from an outline history of the church by centuries. It's a real, real kind of good uh, almanac. And again, in a little bit of self-promotion, I'm going to use two examples of churches one, a brand new church I had designed for St. Joseph's in Spring Valley. And the second is a renovation I did on a church in Croton, Holy Name of Mary. Since I did this renovation almost 20 years ago, they re-renovated. 
So it's a sort of an interesting dialogue. Okay? They kept some of the things they did, and then they changed others. So that's, that's uh, architecture based. Now, I know while I'm doing this, I'm going to be washed very carefully. Okay? Because I am now giving you church instruction. Okay? What I am asking you to do is to unimprint. Just because systemary eustachian tube told you something when you were seven years old, or you saw something done in a church when you were 11, doesn't mean what you saw was the only way something is permitted. So we get imprinted with, you know, the first time we hear about something, as this, that's the first time it's ever been like that, or it's always been like that. It's not always the case. The assembly. Remember what I said about what distinguished Christianity from all previous religions? It was getting together as a group to celebrate. And so churches were designed to let people get together and celebrate. Pews are predominantly an American invention. Uh, a lot of the great churches of Europe never had pews in them, and they still don't. But it was about people together under one roof, and that's still critical, that it's not a proper liturgical celebration if you have people in three different rooms watching it on closed-circuit TV. Get everyone together in one roof. So whereas traditionally we had sort of like a longitudinal look to it, in St. Joseph's in Spring Valley, we were we are encouraged to have people spread around the altar as if you are around a meal, because we don't want to create um, around a table for a meal. We don't want to create a separation of the people from the action that's going on in the altar. It's not about something holy going on up there that we can't participate in. We are part of it. And one of the problems physically is if you put everyone on one side of the building and you have an altar rail and you have everything on this side is that you create a physical separation. This is not improper. This doesn't mean you lose your franchise as a Catholic church. It's just, are we encouraging the participation? And in Holy Name of Mary, what we did was we moved the altar forward out of the apse so that we could put additional seating in the transept. We actually physically took out the confessionals here, created a, room, a chapel of reconciliation in the back, and, because I'm a great believer in preserving the art of the building, as an architect, if I come to an existing building that has beauty to it, I, my mission is to continue that beauty and not to impose my own idiom on it just so everyone knows I was the architect. We reuse the confession fronts to create this root screen as a backing for the altar. And we duplicated it, so this is an extra wide one. But the idea is that we have a craftsmanship where we could preserve the beautiful art that had come before and repurpose it. We took the altar rail and we moved it to underneath the choir loft, creating sort of a, a for, false narthex. So people could be on one side of it and talk casually, but know when they crossed the altar rail, they were in the church proper. So why the assembly? Well, it comes from Matthew 8.20, which is a pretty good document as far as justifying it where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So you don't even need a church, really. If we knock down the church and say, we're just going to meet in the parking lot every Sunday, we may not get the attendance numbers that we were hoping for. Uh, general instruction of in the Roman Missal, at Mass, that is the Lord's Supper. The people of God are called together with a priest presiding and acting in the person of Christ to celebrate the memorial of the Lord, the Eucharistic sacrifice. It is no longer proper for a priest to celebrate Mass by himself. Environment and Art said, the most powerful experience of the sacred is found in the celebration, the act of the assembly. That's why we like liturgies so much. Okay? We baptize during liturgies. We get married during liturgies. We send off our dead during liturgies. We celebrate them every Sunday. And that's where I'm saying the buildings have adapted because the liturgy is essentially the same as it's always been. It's the assembly of everybody together. And the liturgy assembly, according to Built of Livingstone, um, there is no audience. Rather, the entire congregation acts. That's why we're encouraged to come step forward, to give our gifts, 
and receive the Lord. So this concept of like separation really is an ancient temple one. This is a floor plan of the Temple of Jerusalem. This was the court of women. This is as far as women could go. Then you went through this gate, and Israelites could actually get into this section, but you had to be a priest to get into this section. And then you had to be the high priest to get into the sanctuary. You went in there once a year. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So this whole concept of holy separation was not the way the liturgy was in the first century. You were in someone's home. It was a single room. Everyone was gathered around the table. And then that evolved into this, the altar rail, making sure everyone stayed on this side. This side was holy. I remember as a kid, uh, Sister Xavier walking up here giving us instruction for First Communion, and the kid next to me goes, I didn't know women were allowed on the altar. And I was very progressive. I said, who do you think cleans it? Um, but this was separation. And everyone was faced towards the altar and towards the tabernacle. Nothing wrong with it. This was all inspiring. But the question was, did it inspire participation as well? Or did you just sit here and say your rosary because you really weren't involved with what was going on? In St. Joseph's in Spring Valley then, there's no need for the altar rail. We're not kneeling to receive communion. So the altar, the president's chair, and the ambo are very much apart. They're elevated, so they're easier to see. But there really is no separation. And they're all under the same roof. It's not like there's a proscenium. It's not like there's this arch that says, this is where the holy stuff goes. This is where you, the grand, unwashed, unworthy people, get to sit. Nothing personal. In the sanctuary is the place where the altar stands, the word of God is proclaimed, and the priest and the deacon and the other ministers exercise their functions. It should be appropriately marked off in the body of the church, either by it being somewhat elevated or by a particular structure and ornamentation. It should moreover be large enough to allow the Eucharist to be easily celebrated and seen. So in holy name of Mary, raised platform, the altar, the ambo, and the presider's chair. Those are the three elements that must be in the sanctuary area. There is no requirement for an altar rail, but there's no prohibition against it either. So anyone telling you that it has to be one way or the other is incorrect. And if you notice, the tabernacle is not included in those three. There's no requirement for the tabernacle to be in the sanctuary. That table of sacrifice is transformed in the Last Supper to the mensa, the table of the Seder meal, the table of the Eucharist. It's a table that performs two actions. By the late 19th century, that table had been reduced to a shelf up against the wall for some very practical reasons. When you put your tabernacle up here and you have to reach it, there's only so far you can reach when it's high up and away. And the image of table was lost. And so when Vatican II said, move this away, have the priest stand around it, it was an important transformation. This was the altar at uh, Holy Name of Mary. Um, I had imitated the architecture of the building, the arches and the fluted columns. So I brought the architecture of the building to the altar. This is a solid piece of granite, four foot by four foot by six inches. General instruction of the Roman Missal, the altar should be built apart from the wall in such a way that it's possible to walk around it. So those are the directives. You have to walk around it. And it is easily that mass can be celebrated at it facing the people. So there's no question about that. That's the way the Vatican wants it. The altar should be, moreover, be so placed as to be truly the center towards which the attention of the whole congregation of the faithful naturally turns. The altar is usually fixed and dedicated. Everywhere in the world, the altar has to be stone, except 301 tells us in the United States it can be wood. Directive, one altar. That's why you saw all the side altars disappear in a lot of the larger churches. Some churches still have them as part of their historic and artistic tradition, but in new churches, you're not supposed to put, have more than one altar. There's one table around which we celebrate. Um, built of living stone. Uh, should be visible from all parts of the church, but not so elevated that it causes visual or symbolic division from the liturgical assembly. 
again, it should be linked there. The AMBO, little aside. So this is uh, Jesus, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, in Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles. This is the AMBO. And you stand here, fully exposed, with a reading table in front of you. And I asked the artist who created this. I said, why? It's great. I love it. Why? He said he had pictured Jesus walking to the raised edge, which is the mountain. Ambo is Greek for raised edge. Walking up the hill, turning around, and talking. Nothing in front of him. Just him and the people. And that's what he wanted his Ambo to do, was to put as little as possible between the person saying the word of God and the people hearing it. We know it as a pulpit because it was a naval term. Some, but it's technically called the ambo. And, and again, we've seen it in different forms. A lot of times in older churches it was placed high simply because of acoustics. Frequently there would be a solid piece under here to create a reverberation so you could be heard. And in Holy Name of Mary, again, picked up the architecture, raised it, and then a solid piece of granite so that the liturgical book could be displayed until it was put on top and read. In uh, St. Joseph's, same concept. There we were using less refined stone, boulders that were sort of sliced and then polished on one side. So we kept a lot of rough edges. Because uh, those were the boulders, they were the hand of God. This natural rock that we found kept as close to the hand of God as possible, with the hand of man making some slight transformations to it. It's appropriate to be a place, not just a stand, stationary. You shouldn't read announcements from there. It's really meant for the word of God, proclamation of the Psalms, the three readings, the homily. You don't even lead songs from there, unless it's the, uh, the Alleluia or the Psalms. The presider's chair. For a while they called it the president's chair, but everyone found that too confusing. Who's the president? He's the priest. The presider's chair. So it's the third element in the sanctuary. Altar Ampo presider's chair. Because the priest taking the place of Christ in our celebration deserves a place to sit. Now, it should be a little more than this and a little less than that. So those are the three major elements of the liturgy. We have other things that appear in churches that are not critical to the liturgy every week. And uh, those are worth addressing too. One is the baptismal font. Initially, it was you know, done in the river. Most churches don't have easy access to a river. Okay? But you know, occasionally some of our, our brethren in, uh, in the Protestant faith go down to the river and do their immersion there. Baptism is from the Greek to dip. You immerse someone entirely. Part of the symbolism was that you drown to your old life and you're reborn, you're born again to a life in Christ. So the drowning, the immersion, the cleansing of your sin was all important. So the, all the early baptismal fonts that were excavated were meant for adult immersions. Some even shaped like sarcophagi, because you were dying. The tradition in Italy was to create a separate building, whereas uh, eventually we got away from immersion and we were just reducing the symbol to just pouring water on the head. Church prescribes that you should be allowed both options, as an adult or an infant. Water on the head, or an immersion of a child, immersion of an adult. So in Holy Name of Mary, baptismal font, hewn out of the solid piece of granite, we got rid of the little fonts on the wall. So every week at Mass, we encourage you to bless yourself at the instrument of initiation. As a renovation, it was difficult to find enough space to put in an immersion adult font. This is uh, a font. It has running water on it, a little bit of a stream, okay, so that there's a living symbol of water, like a river. We had to adjust the uh, amount of spray because it was gurgling too much, and people in the back rows needed to use the bathroom a little too frequently during the mass. But we, we reduced the noise down. And that, that's a font that can hold a two-gallon baby. That's how you could immerse a child who displaces two gallons worth of water and not have the water spill out of it.
But for adults, what we have is the ability to run the water, have it splay down into this movable font. And for um, the Easter Vigil, we can do an adult immersion in there. And then the ambry with the oils are located in the back. When I did Holy Name of Mary, and we were talking about putting it here, at, we had open sessions where we were explaining what we were doing to the parish. And I had a woman get up. She was very angry with me and said, she was about my age, and she was saying, you know, I've lived in this parish, and the baptismal font has always been up there by the altar. That's where it belongs. That's where it's always been. It has to be there. What do you think we are, Baptists? You know, really got, got my head handed to me. And I said, well, actually, your baptismal font used to be in what you now have as the Lady Chapel. But again, we sort of we grow up with something, and we think it's always been that way. We don't realize that things sort of evolve and change over time. It's not a directive. There's no, nothing that says you have to put it near the entrance. They don't want it to crowd the sanctuary, but it can be up the front. But you do have to preserve the option for immersion, adult and infant. The Eucharistic Chapel, or the tabernacle. Tabernacle is from the Latin word for tent, inspired by the Hebrew word mishkan for dwelling. Again, it was not formally put on the uh, Catholic altar until 1600s. Prior to that, it was kept in the sacristy. In some cases, in medieval churches, it was suspended. The Blessed Sacrament was suspended in the church. Technically, you're not supposed to use the tabernacle as a liturgical pantry. That all the Eucharist consumed at a Mass should be consecrated at that Mass. The act of consecration is supposed to be the central focus. And so one of the discussions is if Jesus is already present in the Blessed Sacrament, right in the middle of the action of the consecration, is that diminishing the miracle of the consecration? And again, the tabernacle, when it was prescribed to be on the altar, was moved to the center and then became uh, part of that shelf. Whereas now, we're looking for the Eucharistic Chapel to be a separate place for veneration of the Blessed Sacrament. It should not compete with the altar of sacrifice, the altar during the liturgy, but it, by all means, should be visible. And it should create a uh, place so that people in small numbers, one or two, coming to an empty church, can kneel in front of the tabernacle and pray. And in Holy Name of Mary, we took a niche that had a statue, made another little niche on the inside, and put the traditional tabernacle in there on the left um, with a lot of illumination on it. So it really punches it out, so it's very visible from the church. Germ 315, it is more in keeping with the meaning of the sign that the tabernacle in which the most holy Eucharist is reserved not be on the altar on which the Mass is celebrated. Consequently, it is preferable the tabernacle be located, according to the judgment of the diocesan bishop, either in the sanctuary apart from the altar of celebration, or even in some chapel suitable for the faithful, private adoration and prayer, readily visible to the Christian faithful. And Holy Name of Mary did the same thing. They moved the tabernacle, they have it in the center behind it. Why? It is technically not a preferred form, okay, because visually, it looks like it's sitting on the altar. Plus, I would argue if you respect the Holy Spirit, I mean, if you respect the uh, Blessed Sacrament, why do you have the priest standing with his back towards it during much of the Mass? Does it mean it's wrong? No, because I'm not here to say what's right or wrong, what's Catholic and what's not Catholic. But I think it doesn't address some of the issues. And those who tell you it's always been there and that's the only way to venerate it are incorrect. And what you find in all these things is that the pastor has the last say. And if you have a diocese that will enforce its directives, they will enforce it, and the pastors don't have the last say. And if you have another a diocese that won't, pastors can do whatever they want. So I expect these tabernacles to be moving back and forth every 6 to 12 years for the next 100 years. So those are the pieces of a church. Uh, we've gone over the vocabulary. You can read it. If there's a takeaway from this is that there is no true and singular Catholic style of art or architecture. Okay? You go into the Asian world or the African world 
and African art and Asian art dominate in their churches. Because the message of Christ is universal, art is merely our interpretation of it. It's a temporal response. And that there are many ways to show respect. Okay? Liturgies have evolved to best serve the people of the church. And you will find differences when you go from region to region. So I try to avoid the argument that says, what's right or what's wrong in a church? You know, is it about inspiring awe? Or is it about participation? I don't even think it's a choice between awe or par participation. I think we should eventually have churches and liturgies that do both. We should be participating and also be awed by what's happening every Sunday. And that concludes the St. Teresa Lecture Series. Thank you.